For me, today is an opportunity to reinforce the fact that uh, we've done what we said we would do. Um, and that's critically important to this government. It's, it really sits at the heart of our values. Um, and uh, I often say to people, uh, with me, what you see is what you get. And I then apologise, but uh, unfortunately, that's the brutal truth. That is, in fact, the brutal truth. And with this government, what you see is what you will get from us. In my address last year, I itemised four distinct areas where we would do things differently to the Napthine government. I observed that the pincer movement that was closing in on Victorians from the state and federal governments was an assault on the Victorian way of life. Uh, I made the point that the Napthine government's $11 billion cuts to services was ultimately unsustainable. I was critical of the poor planning undertaken for key infrastructure projects, uh, including the Melbourne Rail Link, a, a new and never before heard of uh, mega project, and the East-West Link, a new sta stage of a project that up until that state had been, uh, up until the post-election period had been disavowed by uh, the Conservative side of government. And I also expressed the view that the lack of transparency in the unsolicited bid process made it possible for governments to do secret one-on-one -on -one deals with private companies. There seemed to be no transparency whatsoever and no independent oversight until after the fact. Oppositions are, are criticised, often, can I say, rightly so, uh, for writing cheques that in government they can't or they never intend to cash. So I want to spend some time this afternoon outlining those areas where this government uh, has delivered on the commitments that we made prior to the election, how this government's budget delivers on those areas that we said were so important 12 months ago. Firstly, the, this budget delivers on 96% of the commitments that the government took to the people of Victoria at the last election. Uh, now, I know those of you who might be a little bit cynical about politics might say, well, what about the other 4%? Uh, I never claim to be perfect, by the way. Um, but the remaining 4% are those things that we never uh, believed would be able to be implemented until later years in our budget. And if you think about it, a lot of people actually sit back and look at election offerings and they say, well, these are the things that you say that you'll do in the four years that you're in government. Your policies, your commitments are a four-year brief of activity. What I'm saying to you is 96% of the things that we said that we would do are incorporated within this budget. And the remaining four uh, essentially were never intended to start under our uh, direct and express commitments to the Victorian people until later in the term of the government. And you'll hear a lot of misinformation, generally from those who, who seek to, uh, I don't know, take the view that governments never really live up to their expectations uh, about, well, not all the money that you put aside, not all the money that you said you would put aside has been put aside. And can I assure you, um, on the express numbers in the budget, if you look at the particular line items, you'll say, well, that's probably true but you'll also see that there is a very, very, very large uh, contingency uh, uh, or provision of uh, unallocated capital in our budget, uh, leveraging up to about $2.5 billion in the four-year forward estimates that it has been specifically earmarked for decisions that we've made as a government to accommodate each and every one of the commitments that we made to the Victorian people. Because I think increasingly people get to the point where they're cynical about governments uh, and we need, we need ultimately for governments to reconnect to constituencies, to the, the, the people that ultimately uh, take the time to consider the re respective policies uh, as they compete with each other in, the, in public discourse and have some confidence that when they actually vote, their vote means something. Uh, that it won't be trashed the moment uh, we're sworn into government and the things that we said we believed in rapidly become something that are uh, subservient to uh, an alternative agenda that nobody ever saw coming. Uh, what you see is what you get from this government. We're doing uh, what we said we would do because it's important to us and because it really speaks uh, about our values. 
This is the biggest ever budget, uh, education budget. It includes a massive boost for hospitals. It commits record funding for public transport and it will support the creation of 100,000 jobs. This budget delivers on long-standing labour values in a modern and a responsible way. It, it restores funding to those services that have been cut by the previous government and puts growth in operating expenditure back on a sustainable footing. As you can see on this slide, the previous government limited expenditure growth to just 2.5% on average per year. Taking into account inflation and population growth, this simply uh, could, not be, it could not deliver the services that Victorians need, want and quite frankly deserve. The services that they've come to expect and the services that Victorians uh, ultimately uh, deserve from their elected governments. So throttling expenditure growth uh, at just 2.5% would have put a wrecking ball through the services uh, that this state provides, particularly health and education. In contrast, the budget puts in place a more sustainable level of expenditure growth of 3%. It keeps expenditure growth well within revenue growth, and that's, I think, an important thing, um, that uh, the expenditure growth of 3.4% uh, still delivers on our election commitments. Um, uh, and importantly, the restoration of services to Victorians begins with the biggest education budget in the state's history. This government believes that a good education for kids gives them the best start in life. That's why this budget uh, invest $3.9 billion in education and skills over four years. $2.9 billion of this is for schools, the biggest cash injection into uh, the system that's ever been made. The budget also invests $350 million into TAFE, $59 million into Kinders, and $568 million in new and upgraded schools, including money to refurbish 67 uh, schools to rebuild nine schools and to remove asbestos in a classrooms in classrooms right across the state and will provide 12 million dollars to support and establish tech schools also across the state and for the first time Gonski funding levels will be met to the end of 2017 the previous government tore apart the TAFE system in the middle of a youth unemployment crisis the rationale uh, and the thinking behind it uh, was incomprehensible. In stark contrast, this government has included a $350 million injection to save our struggling TAFE system. We believe everyone should have the care that they need, not just the care that they can afford. This budget invests $2.1 billion in Victoria's health system. It provides $200 million to increase hospital capacity and $60 million for an elective surgery boost to cut waiting lists. With this extra funding, what we can expect to see is something like 60,000 patients being treated in our hospital network and 40,000 extra emergency patients. Over $560 million will be dedicated to hospitals in fast-growing areas right across Victoria. Western Women's and Children's Hospital, Casey Hospital, Werribee Mercy Hospital and Anglis Hospital and $40 million in funding to upgrade ambulance branches across the state and also provide new vehicles and equipment that are so vitally important to the effective performance of their responsibilities. As a result of keeping expenditure growth well within revenue growth, we're delivering a $1.2 billion operating surplus in 2015-16 and we're growing that surplus to $1.8 billion in 2018-19. Importantly, our projected surpluses are almost double, almost double the operating results achieved by the previous government. Not promised, but actually achieved. So we've managed to restore essential spending on services while growing the operating surplus. At the same time, uh, we are also reducing state debt. Um, net debt will fall from its June 2014 peak of 6% of gross state product down to 4.4% by June 2019. 
This is a responsible level of net debt and it's lower than estimated by the previous government. Last year I was quite critical of the government's commitment to infrastructure without a solid pipeline of work to, to back it up. We're doing what we said we'd do and we've ramped up uh, spending on infrastructure. This budget has uh, an extensive infrastructure program uh, delivering $5.2 billion in capital expenditure this year and $6.5 billion in capital exp expenditure next year. This is well above the average of $4.9 billion uh, that has been delivered over the previous 10 years and our infrastructure program is spread across a number of projects so we haven't put all our eggs in one infrastructure basket and particularly one whose cost-benefit ratio is less than one. In fact, less than half of one. Any of you who run a business would understand if you're investing in a project that will deliver less than half of uh, your, your input, uh, you're probably not backing a winner. Instead, we've delivered what we said we would do. Uh, funding for a project with a strong business case, the Melbourne Metro Rail Project, and a process in place to be begin removing 50 of Victoria's most dangerous and congested level crossings. The government committed $1.5 billion over the forward estimates period to uh, assist in the delivery of the $9 to $11 billion Melbourne Metro Rail Project. This project will build two nine-kilometre underground rail uh, tunnels stretching from South Kensington to South Yarra that will service an extra 20,000 passengers during peak times. I might I make the point that uh, some who sought to disparage this project as a, a transport link from South Kensington to South Yarra clearly have demonstrated their ignorance of exactly the problems that we confront in managing the, uh, the knot that is the Melbourne Rail Network at the City Loop point. So actually building under the city loop and being able to provide uh, extra throughput capacity will have a profound impact upon the way that we run the network for all network users, regardless of what line they use. The project uh, 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 will uh, provide something like, as I say, 20,000 uh, extra passengers during peak times. Uh, this is the right project. It's the right project that's been well researched, well thought through, Further work has to happen, but it's the right project for the right time. And it's an investment that relieves train congestion in the city loop, and it creates space for more trains right across the network. We've also allocated two to $2.4 billion over four years that's been allocated to the commencement of the level crossing removal program, funded by the proceeds of the long-term lease of the Port of Melbourne. Legislation will be introduced into the Parliament very shortly where I expect bipartisan support for a commitment that both sides of politics shared in the lead up to the last election. Let's hope the things that the previous government said they believed in remain consistent. The case for level crossing removals is strong, both from a safety and an operational point of view. And as we add new trains to the network, boom gate closures will see congestion building to an untenable levels unless we do something. So this slide shows the impact that extra trains will have on congestion levels on four selected crossings on the Dandenong line. By 2021, assuming just three extra services are added in the morning peak, the average closure time and the maximum closure time will have increased to a point where gridlock is a real possibility. If we single out Poth Road, as an example, the boom gates will be down for up to six minutes uh, at a time and a total of 48 minutes in the two hour peak. This budget delivers road record investment in public transport with a 41% increase over 2014-15, including $2 billion for Victoria's first long-term rolling stock strategy this will deliver 20 new E-Class tra trams, 21 velocity carriages, 37 new high capacity trains and the refurbishment of the Comenge and the B-Class tram fleet. This budget also invests $150 million for the next stage 
of the M80 upgrade from Sunshine Avenue to the EJ Whitten Bridge, and might I say complete with safety barriers. Uh, $110 million to duplicate the Chandler Highway Bridge, and $90 million to intelligent transport technology and upgrades to choke points like Swan Street Bridge, Bottleneck. In addition, we're also providing $273 million towards widening CityLink and the Tullamarine Freeway, and $9 million uh, to begin the process of building the Mernda Rail Link. $40 million will deliver works this year to widen Whitehall Street and strengthen and widen Shepherd's Bridge in Footscray, including dedicated pedestrian and cycling lanes. As announced last month, the government has entered into detailed negotiations with Transurban under uh, its market-led proposals uh, policy, and the Western distributor uh, is an issue that will obviously be a matter of quite substantial topical debate over the coming months. However, I want to assure you that the investment that we're making in Whitehall Street and also in Shepherd's Bridge uh, will proceed regardless of that outcome because it's unnecessary piece of infrastructure, it's a no regrets investment and it will ensure better access for heavier load vehicles on that key access point to the city. And now the reasons for the Westgate distributor, why it is in the public domain uh, is clear because I made it clear in this forum uh, when I addressed you last year that I thought the previous government's uh, unsolicited bid processes were just too opaque. I was concerned that the public's interest was very much a distant second to the proponents and ultimately the political views or aspirations of the government of the day. The only value for money assessment of the former government's projects, like the Cranbourne-Packenham line upgrade, was conducted secretly with no opportunity for meaningful debate. Under the market-led proposal guidelines, the process is more transparent and it gives the community greater confidence that its interests are actually being protected by a government who robustly embraces the concept of full declaration and accountability in the processes. So we've delivered a more transparent process that looks at whether proposals, firstly, are in the public interest, whether they represent value for money, and whether they're consistent with government policy and prioritisation. This year's budget is delivered against a backdrop of relatively subdued growth. After growing relatively strongly over the first half of last decade, Victoria's economic growth, as measured by gross state product uh, per capita, has slowed considerably since the onset of the global financial crisis. In real per capita terms, GSP has been virtually flat over the past five years. Real gross state product is forecast to strengthen to 2.5% in 2015-16, up from an estimated 2.25% in 2014-15. Employment has been weak over the past four years. The unemployment rate has risen and spare capacity, uh, that is people in the workforce who believe uh, that they uh, could work more hours or those uh, who are unemployed and would, would seek work combined, uh, we're at a 20-year high in terms of that unutilised capacity of our greatest asset, our people. So in this budget, employment is forecast to grow around its long-run long average, supported by our back-to-work plan, and we're also reaffirming our commitment to help create 100,000 jobs. So I believe everybody in this state uh, has a right to, to the dignity and also the security of a stable job. That's why we have a plan to create 100,000 jobs for 100,000 Victorians. We also recognise that governments don't create jobs. Uh, businesses do, so we'll be supporting Victorian industries, helping them grow and also targeting investment in the sectors where our state has the potential to lead the world. Uh, through initiatives like the Premier's Jobs and Investment Panel, the Future Industries Fund, the Regional Jobs and Infrastructure Fund and the Startup Initiative, we'll grow these sectors that offer the best prospect for future prosperity. There's almost a billion dollars of committed allocations in the context of those commitments. 
So, of course, budgets would be easier for states to deliver if uh, they could be framed in a more consistent and predictable environment. As this slide shows, the removal of $3 billion from the state's allocation of infrastructure funding means we're actually subsidising other states' infrastructure. In fact, uh, that was the case even before Victoria's $3 billion uh, allocation got notionally removed from the federal estimates. Well, actually removed from the federal estimates, still notional in our minds, though. Um, uh, per capita, we're simply not getting our fair share of infrastructure spending. Uh, the Commonwealth uh, argues that a compact state like Victoria needs to spend less on infrastructure uh, and uh, they're certainly uh, living the dream by making Victoria's right to infrastructure a living nightmare. And I'd argue that it's our population density relative uh, to the rest of Australia that's driving the need to invest in new infrastructure. Quite often, it's a tyranny of proximity and urban congestion that brings the greatest costs associated with building infrastructure uh, in a built-up environment. So the decision by the Commonwealth to remove $3 billion from Victoria's infrastructure allocations was at odds with the signal the Prime Minister himself had given. Uh, who can forget, I'm not going to rip off Victorians? Um, or indeed, that other great quote, um, uh, East, uh, the Victorian election is a referendum on East-West. It's a little difficult to tell exactly where the Commonwealth are trying, what they're trying to achieve in respect of their treatment of East-West funding in their budget last night. Certainly it came as uh, much a surprise to me as everyone, particularly after uh, the Federal Treasurer promised me no surprises. I suspect he must have a very strange definition of what surprises him. Um, uh, but to see $3 billion withdrawn from um, uh, Victoria uh, on the stroke of a pen uh, without any forewarning, uh, a week before, a week after we'd framed our own budget, that's a, a sign of uh, what I would call uh, the closest thing to juvenile behaviour when it comes to managing an economy uh, I could consider, I could think of. Should the Westgate distributor become uh, move beyond the stage three process, I would continue to look forward to a Commonwealth contribution that would restore. Can I put it this way, some sanity uh, to the graph that you see in front of you on the screen. To have every Victorian, every Victorian subsidising the rest of Australia to the tune of $122 uh, each and every Victorian is an affront. It's an insult to our Federation and it really does demonstrate that politics writ large uh, leads to very poor outcomes. So despite the hurdles that the Commonwealth Government has thrown up, this budget delivers the commitment that the Government took to the people of Victoria at the last election. Uh, we're doing what we said we would do. It gets the balance right and we're also restoring services, prioritising those things that are important to families, health, education and the protection of the vulnerable. And we're delivering the right infrastructure at the right time, the right projects properly thought through, properly justified, I might I say even properly debated. This budget also continues the Labor tradition of robust financial management. We're delivering a strong operating surplus, low net debt levels and sustainable and resilient expenditure growth. This budget delivers on the long-standing Labor values. It delivers them in a modern and a responsible way. Thank you very much.